I endeavored to combat the theories he had formed. I was serious and felt grieved on considering all the consequences they may produce. You appear thoughtful and downcast, Doctor. What's the matter with you? Have I found out that we part of your armor? Sire, there are medicines, the efficacy of which has been tried and proved. Like those Corvusar used to give to the Empress, pills composed of crumbs of bread, which operated with excellent effect. Maria Luisa one day extolled their virtues. They are all alike. No, sire. What an obstinate man. Just what I expected. Facts are visible and causes are occult. But I am one of yours. I have practiced. You, sire? Myself. But your majesty did not prescribe? Can you ask me such a question? What would have become of my dignity? I should have been looked upon as an intruder. You chose your remedies, and they were not unpleasant to take. Sometimes, but generally speaking, I did not draw them from the apothecary shop, water, air, and cleanliness, were the chief articles of my pharmacopoeia, and I seldom had recourse to any other means. You laugh at my method, do so. Your colleagues in Egypt laughed at it also, but experience demonstrated that my flannel and brush were preferable to their pills. I understand you, sir. I see that like a worthy Christian, you are surprised at my ablutions, but we were destroyed by the plague and by assassination. The Arabs murdered my soldiers, and the doctors refused to attend them. I could not forsake them in their miserable condition. I vainly endeavored to animate the courage of the professional men whose devotion is generally so conspicuous, and punished one of them who had shown himself more pusillanimous than the others by degrading him and causing him to be walked through the streets of Alexandria with a board upon which was written, he is not a Frenchman. He fears death. Still, the ignominy of one did not restore energy to the others. The service was carried on tamely, and the ravages of the disorder remained unabated. I made some advances to the sheiks and ordered the troops to encamp. Tranquility was restored. The malady ceased, and I derived great advantage from the step I had taken. However, approve or blame as you think proper. Here's the audience. Ordinance. Cairo, ninth pluvio, seventh year of the Republic, to General Marmont. I suppose, citizen general, that you have changed the system of service of Alexandria and that you have placed small and permanent posts in the various batteries on the height of the observatory and at the battery of Deban. For instance, you will have placed 12 or 15 men who are not to go out of it and whom you will keep there cut off from all communication. The sentry required to guard the post will be taken from those 12 or 15 men. Your position with respect to the sea relieves you from the necessity of exercising any considerable degree of surveillance at this moment, and you therefore want but few troops. But why do you employ grenadiers for the service of the town? I cannot comprehend the obstinacy of Commissary Michaud in remaining in his house, since it is infected by the plague. Why does he not go and place himself on a hill near the column of Pompeii? All your battalions are at least half a league distant from each other. Keep but a small number in town. And it being the most dangerous post, do not keep any chosen troops there. Place a battalion of the seven, the Fifth, under those trees where you have long been stationed with the 4th Regiment of Light Infantry. Let it bivouac there and let all communication between the battalion and the town in Egypt be strictly forbidden. Send the battalion of the 85th towards Maribon, where it can easily be furnished with supplies by sea. With respect to the unfortunate demi brigade of Light Infantry, order the men to be stripped stark naked and bathed in the sea. Let every man scrub himself well from head to foot and thoroughly wash his clothes and see that they keep themselves clean in future. No more parades. No more guards. Let everyone remain in the camp. Order a large pit to be dug filled with quick lime to throw the dead in. From the moment a French house is infected with the plague, let the individuals belonging to it be either in camp or barracks, but let them care Carefully avoid the house and let them be placed in reserve in the open air. Lastly, order everyone to wash his hands and face every day and keep himself clean. If you cannot preserve the whole of the core where the disorder has appeared from the contagion, preserve at least the majority of your garrison. It appears to me that you have not yet taken any measures commensurate with the circumstances in which you are placed. 
He was amusing himself with corresponding with Menu. He was writing, joking, losing time, and only busying himself about the turban and the wife. That old fool. Those blindfold marriages are very dangerous, said the one. They have succeeded in my case, rejoined the other. Is Madame handsome? She is very desirable. Shall you use the privilege? No, and a hundred fooleries of the same kind. But read on. If I had not at Alexandria some depots, which I cannot do without, I should have already told you to go with your garrison and a camp three leagues off in the desert. I know that you cannot now do this, but approach as near to it as you can. Endeavor to impress on your mind the spirit of the instructions contained in this letter. Execute them in as far as they are practicable, and I hope you will derive some benefit from them. Bonaparte, the 28th. The emperor had suffered in the night with acute pains in the liver. He was better this morning. I was relating to the emperor the discussions I had heard at Florence respecting the nobility of his family and the causes of its emigration. Those causes are very simple, said he. The last of my ancestors who inhabited Tuscany professed the same principles as I do. He defended them as I defended mine, and like me, he fell a victim to them. The foreign faction prevailed. The national party was defeated and outlawed, and Bonaparte sought an asylum first at Sarzan and afterwards at Corsica. But the family intercourse did not cease. His descendants continued to correspond with the members of the branch that was settled at San Miniano and addressed to them. Those are their children whom they wish to send to study at Pisa. That branch is now extinct. The good canon of whom I spoke to you was the last shoot of it. He died, I forget now in what year, and left me his fortune, which I devoted to the assistance of the suffering classes in Tuscany. My own nobility dates from Milsimo, Rivoli, and from the 18th Brumaire, where I defeated the plots lead against the nation. The nobility of my family is more ancient. Its origin is lost in the obscurity of the Middle Age. The genealogist Joseph alone could trace it to its source. He pretends to be descended from... I know not how many obscure tyrants. Attempts are frequently made to bring my vanity into play on that subject, but the bait would not take. I never would listen to any of these suggestions. After the Battle of Arcole, when I was general in chief of the Army of Italy, the whole population of Treviso came out to meet me. My ancestors had held the first rank in that city. They presented me the axe of parchments that proved it and offered me the sovereignty which my family had lost at Bologna. Mariscaldi, Caprera, and Aldini came by order of the Senate to lay before me the Golden Book, in which the name and the arms of my family were inscribed. At a later period, I was obliged to advance as far as Tolentino. I was unwilling to display bayonets before priests or to wage war with the saint, but 75,000 Frenchmen had already been murdered under his reign. It was too much. I resolved to put an end to it. All those who surrounded me insisted upon overthrowing the idol, but France had become Catholic again. It was necessary to render the revolution popular, to use the influence of the priesthood, and I therefore had recourse to negotiations. Besides, we obtained rich provinces and and the port of Ancona, whence one might in 24 hours pass into Macedonia. That was a fine result. The Pope's envoys exclaimed against my victories and the rapidity with which Italy had been conquered and the Austrians defeated. I was, said one of them to me, the first Frenchman who had marched against Rome since the Conetable de Bourbon. And what was rather singular, the history of the first expedition had been written by one of the ancestors of the man who commanded the second the expedition to Egypt. And the consulate put all the genealogists in motion. Every parchment was turned over and consulted. I was allied to the ancient house of Est, to that of England. In short, it is impossible to say to whom I did not belong. The Duke of Feltro was particularly anxious about these researches. A female of the Bonaparte family had married a Medici. Another had given birth to Paul V, a third to, I know not what other presage, I was allied to scepters and tiaras by the women and to literary fame by the men. The latter had distinguished themselves as historians and dramatists in jurisprudence and in diplomacy. Have you read The Widow? Or at least have you heard of it whilst you were in Florence? I replied in the negative. 
It is an old play, continued the emperor, but not devoid of interest. The manuscript of it is at Paris in the National Library. The author was a distinguished writer who is much spoken of in Masticelli's biography of the writers of Italy. It was he who instituted at the University of Pisa the class of jurisprudence, which afterwards became so celebrated. But to return to the attempts that were made to prove that I am nobly descended, we were in the year 1810 and yielding to the proposals I had refused in 1805. I had allied myself to Austria. The Emperor Francis, who thought much more of the luster derived from parchments than that acquired by victory, ordered all the archives of Italy and Germany to be searched and at last succeeded in finding the document he wanted. He informed me of the circumstance and begged me to allow him to publish them. But I excused myself in the best way I could and refused. He insisted, wrote to me, spoke to me about it again when we were at Dresden. I could not at all understand what has preceded my repugnance to consent to his wishes. For after all, it was in honor to be descended from a family of sovereigns, as he could prove that mine was by producing the title deeds and documents he had obtained. Those titles, said I, are too ancient for me. Mine date only from Milsimo. You date from a much earlier period. No, I go no higher, but he understood at last that I prided myself more upon being the Rudolph of my own family than the descendant of some odious legitimate a sovereign family! Maria Luisa must be informed of this discovery. She will appreciate the value of it. It will please her. Do tell Maria Luisa of it. I requested him to make the communication himself and did not conceal from him the little importance I attached to the affair of that nature. He felt hurt at the manner in which I received what he thought would have been a most agreeable surprise prepared for me. His care and trouble had been thrown away. I despair despised titles, and was after my disastrous Amir Jacobin, had I consented to this foolery, who knows, but there might have been 100,000 men less on the plain of Leipzig.